Okay, it looks like it is five past the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Olympia Regional Airport Master Plan Update Technical Advisory Committee meeting number two. We appreciate everyone for joining us today. We know you're all very busy and we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here and provide input. So um, we met last time, but we'll just go around the room and introduce the project team. Um, I'm Leah Whitfield. I serve as the project manager. Justin Hyde. I'm uh, the uh, lead planner on this project. Darren Murata, and I'm uh, the engineer. Uh, Haseeb Mirza, and I'm the aviation planner on this project. Zach Duvall, I'm an aviation planner on this project as well. And I think from the port we have Mr. Rudolph as well. Yes, I, um, I am here and I'm uh, glad to be here. Thanks for everyone for joining. Thanks, Rudy. So just a couple of um, participation notes for everyone. We're going to go ahead and mute all the participants during the presentation. Um, however, if you have a comment or a question, you can either use the raise your hand button under participants or under the reactions, depending on which version of Zoom that you have. Or you can also type a comment in the chat box and Zach will be monitoring that for us throughout the presentation. And on the right hand of your screen, you'll see an example of where that raise that hand button might be. But thank you again for your participation and feel free to um, submit a comment or a question at any time. So we'll briefly go through our agenda. So what is an airport master plan? We went through that last time, but I know we might have a couple of new people joining us this during meeting number two. So I wanna make sure everyone understands what an airport master plan is and also what it isn't. And then of course, just really defining your role as a member of the technical advisory committee for the master plan update. And then we'll touch on our master plan schedule and give you an update there. And then last time we met, we touched briefly on the aviation forecast. Um, but we've since completed the draft forecast, submitted it to FAA for review, received comments back, and resubmitted our revised aviation forecast. So we want to give you an update on the aviation forecast. And then we really want to spend the bulk of our time in facility requirements and alternatives. So facility requirements is really where we define um, what we need to do at the airport, whether it's maintenance or capital infrastructure, to um, meet the demand of the forecast in the 20-year uh, planning horizon. And then also, of course, meet a, uh, FAA standards because they do change periodically. And there's been quite a few changes, I think, since the last airport master plan. And there's even some new changes coming as well in the new design advisory circular. And then we're going to really kind of dive in, roll our sleeves up and have an alternatives discussion. And this is where we really want it to be a conversation with you uh, because it's important that we get your feedback before we really kind of sit down at the drawing board and start figuring out where things might go in the airport in the future. And then we'll just kind of go through next steps and take any questions and comments. So what is an airport master plan? Well, first, what is it not? So it's really not meant to solve the airport management operations or maintenance issues. So it's really more focused on that capital infrastructure and it's a comprehensive study of what an airport needs in the short, the medium and the long term um, to meet that future aviation demand. And there is a process that we follow that is dictated by the FAA Master Plan Advisory Circular. And in that, you'll kind of see what's included. So the inventory, the forecast, these are all of kind of the various chapters that we will put together for the draft and the final report. So last time we met, we really went through that, AV, that airport inventory and the aviation forecast. We started to get into that. We'll focus a little more on that today. And then we move into that facility requirements where we define the needs of the airport and then the alternatives is the fun part where we kind of look at it as a puzzle and we say, where would all the pieces go in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 plus years? And all of that kind of rolls into a preferred alternative that gets drawn up on what's called an airport layout plan. And the airport layout plan is a really important step in the master plan because there's only two things the FAA formally approves, and that's that aviation forecast and the airport layout plan or the ALP. And so we we have the ALP, it has a lot of different sheets, but it really dictates what can happen at the airport. If it's not on that airport layout plan that's approved by the FAA formally, then it can't be built on the airport property. And then we take that preferred development alternative and we turn that into the capital improvement plan. And that might include things like 
rehabilitating a piece of pavement or a new piece of pavement or correcting a, an angle in the pavement to meet those design standards or perhaps even new um, hangers to meet that forecasted aviation demand. So all of that will get wrapped into the CIP. We'll create a five, 10, 20 year CIP and we'll have the cost estimates and then we'll also look at kind of the funding feasibility piece as well because that's what's important to the port is how do we fund the airport moving forward for those capital costs. So your role as a member of the Technical Advisory Committee is to really give us representative input from your organization or the business that you represent. And it's really important to the success of the master plan because you know your airport and your community better than we do as the airport consultant. And of course, it's a limited time commitment. This is your second meeting out of four, so we're halfway there. Thank you again. And we also really like you to review the draft report and provide input on the report. And of course, the final report as well. And then you're welcome to reach out to any of the consultant team and provide suggestions at any time. So where are we in the schedule? So the project kicked off in March and we're kind of at that wrapping up the investigation phase. We really see three key phases in the master plan, investigation, solutions, and implementation. So we're wrapping up that investigation phase right now with kind of our draft airport facility requirements chapter. And that's our second TAC meeting. And then we're starting to move towards the solutions phase. And the solutions phase is really, again, where we dive into the alternatives and see how all the puzzle pieces can fit together. And we look at the environmental review and we determine our preferred alternative. So we'll be moving into that later in August at the start, the start of September. And we'll be completing that kind of through February. And so we'd hope to meet with you again in September for our third technical advisory committee meeting. And then of course, Still looking forward to um, wrapping up the project in summer of 2022 with that capital improvement plan and the airport layout plan. And of course the draft and the final report. So you will note, and I just wanna point out that we originally had thought we would do a public open house in July. And since the port is still restricting in-person meetings through this month, we've decided to go ahead and push that to September and push September's to later in October in hopes that we can meet with the public in person. All right, thank you, Leah. You know, again, my name is Justin Hyde and I'm gonna dive us into the uh, forecast review that has been submitted to the FAA and uh, then we'll move on to the facility requirements after that. So as far as the forecast, it's it has been submitted to the FAA for review and it's basically an overall look at the airport's facility needs that we uh, gather the information, figure out what what's needed through the based aircraft and the operations that are occurring at the at the airport. Um, it, we're putting together a realistic forecast that's based on the available information at the time, and there has been uh, some information that the FAA put out for for a, a base year for for 2020 that has been pulled. So we've used 2019. Uh, terminal area forecast numbers per the FAA's uh, request and desire for that. And so we're putting together what we know uh, to be the best forecast that we can have coming out of the pandemic. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, FAA's stance uh, because of those odd numbers in this odd year is that any project that comes out of this master plan is gonna require justification on its own uh, for future future planning purposes. So this forecast is going to focus on planning activity levels and triggering events uh, needed to be able to justify those projects. So the process of uh, doing a forecast is, is basically determining that current aviation activity through uh, counting up the based aircraft that spend the majority of the time at the airport and the operations that occur at the airport. And an operation is a takeoff and, a, and or a landing. And so we take all that information of what is happening at the airport, do all our research, and then we go into review. And we're looking at the national, state, and local uh, trends that are going on along with the, the socioeconomic characteristics of the region to figure out what is gonna be best and how is everything moving uh, relatively uh, in, throughout the years. And then we prepare our aviation forecast and use those projections to, to come up with a percentage number for growth. And that, uh, that forecast is then submitted to the FAA, which this one has been, and it is under review for approval. And like Leah said, this is one of the two documents that goes for approval for the FAA. 
So let's look at what the numbers that we came up for that current aviation activity. And so we have 124 total based aircraft on the field. Any given day, there's probably more aircraft than that on the airport, but we have to count the aircraft that are based there more than six months out of the year. So any seasonal aircraft that may only be there four months, five months, those actually get registered at whatever airport they are at uh, hitting that six month mark. So we have 124 based aircraft and then uh, a little over 70,000 operations. And those are split up into local and itinerant operations. Local operations are, are those that kind of remain in the pattern and in the area doing training. And then itinerant are the ones that are flying in and arriving from a different destination. It comes out to about 193 operations a day. And uh, the what we're taking and gathering that information for the total operations is the air traffic control tower logged numbers and also uh, the after hours numbers that we've gotten from the users. So in order to evaluate those trends, we look at all the trends that are going on through national, regional, state, and local. And as they filter down, you see the big national numbers for the terminal area forecast, and then it filters down to the region, the state, and the local. And we gather the most data in the local area and gathering up the the FAA's data, user surveys, FBO data, air traffic control logs, and then the uh, instrument flight operations that are occurring at the airport. With that, and there's a lot of information on this slide, and, and what this is for is to allow you to see that local, regional, and national data for based aircraft. This is, this is the percentage and growths that they had predicted and seen in their forecasts, and these were all used in uh, our formulas to justify and come up with our forecast for uh, the Olympia Regional Airport. So the based aircraft, there's 124 in our base year for 2020. And as it grows through the short term in 2025, we expect there to be a small growth up to 128 aircraft. The 10 year mark should see about 132 aircraft and the long term forecast of the, the whole planning period of 20 years will be at 139 aircraft. It's really interesting in the in the region and the nation hangars are on a on a shortage. And so it's really a, if you build it, they will come type of situation. And as if a 10 unit T hanger were to be built tomorrow at Olympia, you would almost immediately see 10 10 aircraft. Uh, in that based aircraft number increase. So it'd be 134 almost overnight. But without uh, any information on that, we're stuck with uh, using that until there's plans for those hangars. So following that same, same logic, we go through the operations. And on the top bar, you can see the towered operations year over year back to 2011. And that, those are the numbers the air traffic control tower uh, reports to the airfield management that occur between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. The bottom chart down there is an 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. estimate that we've done, uh, put together through interviews with the stakeholders. And it adds a little over 5,000 operations for, for the year that occur in the evening hours. So our total, well, our total comes out to about 70,000. We'll go into that a little bit more. So the data we collected there then gets broken down into what type of aircraft that we're looking at. And so the FAA separates everything by a, kind of a approach speed, which is the aircraft approach category, and then the design group, which uh, looks at the tail height and the wingspan. Right now, uh, the widths of the runway, everything's kind of set up for a, a much larger aircraft than what we're seeing. Those are about D3s is what the airport is currently designed to, but we're really looking at a, a B2 and a C2 type of uh, situation, uh, similar to what the last master plan was. As you can see, this is landing fee data that we've gathered for aircraft that are over 12,500 pounds and taking in their approach category of that A, B, C, and D, the, their approach categories are generally in the B category with Cs increasing and a few Ds as well. And then the design group, we're looking at uh, a strong two. So just by this graph alone, we're looking at a, at a really strong B2 situation for the airport and a design category there with growth into a C2. What we need to be able to do to identify that critical aircraft is have 500 operations done uh, within the category or by that design aircraft group. 
And so uh, we are a strong B2 going into a C2. And uh, again, like the based aircraft, this is all that regional data put together into a, a chart, national, local, and regional, to be able to say, this is where the numbers came from for your edification in that. So our forecast came up with a growth rate for the itinerant operations of about 0.87% annually, and then the local operations a little bit higher at uh, 0.92 with all the training activity that occurs at the airport. And overall, we are seeing uh, a growth from 70,000 operations uh, through the planning forecast up to 84,000 operations. And we expect as the based aircraft number increases, if it increases outside of the forecast projections through extra hangars being built, we uh, expect that would increase as well, the, the operations would. So in summary of all of that, this is just a snapshot of both growth trends for based aircraft and total operations through the planning period. But the, we've been able to identify the critical aircraft currently is the Cessna Citation family there, and they're generally a B-2, with the critical aircraft being a Bombardier Challenger type aircraft in the 700s uh, up to C-2. And we see quite a few operating there, but they're not breaching that 500 operations count. And so as you can see on this chart over on the right hand side, uh, you can see the B2C2 that have been highlighted. And that's basically where we're at. They're uh, decent sized corporate jets that are operating in and out of the airport regularly. So taking that forecast information, we've dived into the facility requirements. The facility requirements is going to be based off of what the forecast is projecting and promoting. So we have uh, a look at the runways and a look at the taxiways and dimensions and widths by, uh, with a reference of the forecast that we have come up with. As you can see in this table, this one's more for your information when you look back at uh, throughout through the slides, but we see runway 1735 and then runway 826. And this just gives you kind of the information where we're at and the lengths. Uh, you can see the cursor there is showing a length of 5,500 feet for runway 1735, 4,157 for runway 826. And it just gives some detailed information of what uh, each of those runways have. And runway 1735 being the primary runway does have the precision approach with the Malzer on or the, the approach lighting on uh, runway 17 and then uh, with the uh, Pappies and end identifier lights. And runway 826 is a visual runway without lighting. So we, we understand that the, uh, the runways and what they are from the last slide, but when we look at the wind analysis, this is a very critical point to uh, examine this, there's a, a variation that occurs from true north to magnetic north. And you may notice when you look at a Google Earth uh, picture of the airport, it, one would assume that the runway is, is pointed to the, to the east, and that's uh, looking at a true north uh, picture of it. When you look at magnetic north, we are sitting at a runway 17 designation currently. And what is going to have to happen and occur is the runways are going to have to be repainted due to this magnetic variation. There's a, a one degree shift about every 10 years that occurs uh, throughout the, you know, in this region where everything just kind of shifts just a little bit. And as we look at the runways, we've hit that point where the 17 is going to now become runway 18. You can see in the, in the diagram there, in the windrows, that the, we've topped over that uh, 355 degree mark. And that's the calling point to get to a 36 designation. So it's recommended that the runways be renumbered to their correct, correct magnetic heading due to the changes uh, that have occurred. And this will happen during a regular airport project when there's going to be restriping, repainting type of thing. So this slide looks at the widths and lengths of the runway. On the left-hand side, we have the length. And both runways have adequate length for, to accommodate the aircraft that regularly utilize the airport. You can see the dry and wet configurations. And what we're seeing is that aircraft that are, you know, up to 60,000 pounds, we can accommodate 75% of the fleet of, the, of those aircraft. And that's at a 90% useful load. And these 
figures are put together by the FAA by collecting everybody's operating standards and, and coming up with averages. And so the majority of the aircraft will be able to utilize the runway that are uh, of great weights. And when we look at the widths, the, we, we're exceeding the FAA standard currently on both runways. The existing is 150 feet and uh, for runway 1735, and it's required to be 100 feet when we look at that C2 designation. And so what we have to consider is uh, the justification for the width of the runway and the runway 1735 being that it exceeds that operational width, width requirement, we'll need to figure out the funding side of those, that 50 extra feet that uh, is associated with that. Uh, the FAA has uh, worked with many airports before to help maintain that the existing pavement, but when it comes to reconstruction, if it ever falls to that point, uh, they will be going to the required width of 100 feet. So we want to make sure we're maintaining what we have. Runway 826 also exceeds the operational width requirement. We uh, recommend continuing to maintain that, but only to the 75 foot width that the, uh, the FAA has uh, shown is required and uh, that's currently what the airport is doing. So when we look at the, the uh, taxiways as we come off of the runways, we notice that there's a uh, geometry significant uh, layout for the airport. There's uh, lots of taxiways everywhere and this was airport was built in a time when, when it wasn't a standard configuration but more of a point to point configuration. And so our taxiways do not meet the uh, 90 degree or a right angle intersection requirement now by the FAA uh, that they like to see. And so what we want to be able to uh, recommend throughout this facility requirement is that we have a, a parallel taxiway, which would be taxiway whiskey on the west hand side. Um, it currently isn't a true parallel. It, it uh, is angled significantly. And so uh, we would recommend that it be revised to serve as a full length parallel taxiway along with analysis for a full length parallel taxiway for 826. And analysis only because the funding for that will be very difficult, uh, but just to be able to see if it is ever required ways to be able to accommodate that. And it's also recommended to uh, add optimally located exit taxiways that are outside of that middle third of the runway and uh, be able to increase the efficiency of the air aircraft as they're in and out of uh, from takeoff and departure, and then uh, fixing the right angles as uh, projects are moving along. As you can see, here's just a uh, overview of a picture of the air airport there and how the taxiways all intersect. Uh, taxiways vary from three, uh, 35 feet wide to 50 feet wide, and, and the general uh, makeup of this would be about a, a requirement would be about 35 feet wide and you can see that uh, we have taxiways some that are lit and some that are reflectors and if you're familiar with the airport the west side is is generally lit and the east side has the reflectors and the recommendation out of this that especially in talking with with users of the airport is all the general aviation traffic that are taxiing down taxiway echo in, in the night hours and they they could use some extra visibility, especially for marking out the edges of the taxiway with lighting. And that would allow them to taxi from taxiway echo to runway 17 or up all the way and crossing 17 back down to runway 35 in the evening hours if needed uh, in a fully lit type situation. So we'll quickly go through just some of the extra electronic and visual aids uh, for the airport. There's three wind cones on the airfield. You have a, a compass rose with a wind cone, or excuse me, you have a segmented circle with a wind cone in the middle of it. On the north end, a, a wind cone for uh, runway 26 down just north of that, and then a wind cone on the west side of runway 35. We have a, a weather system. It's an ASOS, an automated surface uh, observing system, and it allows aircraft to be able to gain uh, weather information, real-time weather information via their radios as they're approaching the airport or getting ready to take off. And it can also be called into on a phone number uh, for pilots that are on the ground waiting to uh, get to their aircraft. And there's no recommendations for that. It's working uh, well and as prescribed. Uh, there's also a Vortac the Vortac, it's an instrument uh, 
uh, an instrument that that pilots use, and there there are many VORs throughout the nation that p pilots use to be able to uh, fly across country, and uh, were heavily used prior to GPS straight line flying, and uh, but still heavily used on the instrument side. And the last master plan had discussed moving the VOR or the Vortac uh, from its location there in the middle of the airfield to be able to create a parallel taxiway all the way through. But the FAA has responded with that that Vortac will be remaining in its location, current location. So all the planning requirements that we do from now on out will be around that rather than trying to plan through it. There's a rotating beacon that is uh, working as prescribed on top of the water tower on the uh, northwest side of the airfield. And then there's also a compass rose uh, located on Taxiway Charlie. And the, the only recommendation with that would be to be maintaining it and keeping it uh, painted in, in uh, true magnetic uh, uh, alignment. For roadways and parking, the air, airport is uh, directly off of I-5. It makes it really nice to be able to, to get to the airport for the public and then also for people coming into the airport, gives them an opportunity to be able to uh, gain access to Olympia and Seattle and just be able to spread out throughout. And it uh, provides ease of access, which is very good for the, for the users of the airport. And then there's also roadways around the airport to be able to to access all points. And so there's no real uh, recommendations there at that point. The public parking is uh, set up with a, a small general parking area for the public, but each business has their own uh, private parking areas, private for their users and, and people coming in and utilizing their, their services. And so the recommendation with that would be able to, as there's growth, maintain uh, appropriate parking requirements for each business that comes in. And so that parking is continuing, continuing to be added as growth occurs. So moving into the support facilities, uh, there isn't a avionics shop that's known regionally uh, in the area, which is fantastic. That brings aircraft in and out and that's Olympia Avionics. Airframe and power plant is needed at the airport, but there is discussions of that occurring at some point. As far as fuel storage is concerned, there are spots for eight tanks uh, with containment for 96,000 gallons. Six tanks are in use, and two tanks have just been leased, or two spots have just been leased uh, for two additional tanks to be added. So all the spaces for uh, tanks in there will be accommodated and, and uh, in use, and so that's uh, fantastic. There's plenty of fuel on the airfield, and uh, it looks like each FBO will have uh, four tanks. There is no de-icing or airport wash pads on the airfield, and that's something to consider um, in the in the very long long term of the planning period. Here, we want to be able to take a look at those, but they will require significant environmental uh, investigation into both of those. Those are both. Uh, issues with uh, runoff that can occur with the icing and washing aircraft. And so um, that's something that, that can be looked into as a uh, future possibility if the needs arise. Airport maintenance and equipment is currently stored under the plane port. You can see in the picture there. The reason it was used as uh, equipment storage is the hangar right behind it was built in such a way that it made the, the plane port that faces that hangar kind of unusable for the aircraft due to wingtip clearances. And so what we can uh, do is say in the future, we may need to look at options for uh, enclosed maintenance and equipment storage uh, to be able to keep them out of the elements, especially as the equipment uh, inventory list uh, grows throughout the future. And then uh, with utilities, we have power that's provided by Puget Sound and Energy with major trunk lines around the airport. We're not concerned with the uh, uh, utilities for the airport, but just making sure that we're planning for the future as needs arise. Uh, with two FBOs, uh, generally if we're looking at an airport that is either lacking an FBO or only has a single FBO but needing more uh, put, there might be a recommendation for more FBOs, but I think with two FBOs we see uh, great access for pilots and uh, there's room uh, for both 
companies to grow and room for competition. So it's a, a fantastic thing that the airport has. There are tie down spaces uh, available for the users of the airport. And uh, all the, the only recommendation we would have there is as the airport grows and uh, more hangars are built and transient aircraft are coming in that uh, tie down spaces are considered in those uh, apron designs as well. Hangers, uh, what we know about hangers, and like I said, that's uh, if you build it, they will come type, type of situation. This master plan will be looking at places and uh, places to put hangers and how to allocate them and where they should go to best serve the needs of the airport. So that will all be addressed, but uh, the environmental concerns also have to be addressed. So it's uh, strongly recommended that the airport expand aircraft parking and prior prioritizing hangar space. But with uh, once the HCP has gone through its uh, full review, but the master plan will be looking at hangers and where to put them and, and how that should all be constructed. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hasib, who's going to talk on a couple of exciting points for biofuels and electric aircraft. Thanks, Justin. So as uh, most of us might be aware, airports are constantly evolving to address uh, issues facing the aviation industry. And one of the biggest concerns uh, facing the industry at the moment is the environmental impact as demand continues to grow. Uh, so there are two trends uh, emerging in the industry the, uh, hoping to address uh, these concerns. So the first of which is biofuels. Uh, the International Energy uh, Agency forecasts that uh, we'll be reaching a 20% demand uh, by 2040. An example of this is uh, United Airlines uh, purchasing approximately 10 million gallons of uh, biofuels uh, at LAX. So there are a handful of uh, biofuel options, but the most prominent uh, is, are made from uh, waste oils and animal fats. Now, currently they're uh, two to three times more expensive than uh, jet fuel, but as uh, biofuel technology continues to develop, and uh, more refineries are established, uh, it is forecasted that we'll be able to close that gap. Uh, additionally, manufacturers are developing aircraft that are able to use uh, biofuels blended with conventional fuel. Uh, now an issue with this, an, inv an infrastructure issue with uh, hybrid fuel is uh, quality control, uh, ensuring that there isn't any contamination. So uh, it's recommended that uh, jet fuel and biofuel be uh, kept in separate tanks and then combined into a third tank on site at the airport. Justin. Now moving on to uh, electric aviation, um, the Washington State Department of Transportation's uh, electric aircraft feasibility study recommended uh, Olympia Airport as an initial beta test site for electric aircraft. Uh, some of the factors they considered was uh, have uh, Olympia having an air, uh, a runway uh, larger than, longer than uh, 3,000 feet, uh, having a need for aviation service uh, connected to uh, airports within uh, 500 nautical miles, uh, the presence of two FBOs, and the availability of jet fuel for hybrid electric aircraft. Now, in order to integrate electric aircraft into the existing transportation network, uh, the airport will need to uh, uh, incorporate it into its uh, strategic planning. Now, the things to consider is the electrical infrastructure needs and the level of expected demand. Uh, as uh, electric aircraft operations continue to grow, uh, it will increase the demand both on the airport and its electrical grid and it will require an updated, uh, upgraded power distribution system to uh, ensure uh, safe uh, charging. So there's multiple ways of ensuring that the airport meets its demand. Uh, there's on-site generation through turbines or uh, solar pan panels. Uh, there's working with the uh, local energy providers. And uh, if that isn't possible, then uh, the airport might wanna consider uh, power usage management, which is uh, putting a cap on charging to limit uh, the peak uh, uh, usage on the electrical grid. Now, 
Now there are two methods of uh, being considered for providing energy to electric aircraft. Uh, the first of which is uh, battery swapping, which uh, as it sounds, uh, replaces spent battery out for uh, a fully charged battery. Now, some of the benefits of this is that it has a leak peak, uh, lesser peak demand on the electrical grid and uh, has the potential to reduce turnaround time. Uh, however, there is a concern with uh, uh, the potential for error uh, during the installation process. And it is currently being tested out in the e-caravan out of uh, Moses Lake. Uh, the second method is uh, on-site direct uh, aircraft charging, which is similar to uh, what we see with electric vehicles today. Um, an issue with this is that uh, an industry standard hasn't been established. So any charging, sta uh, charging station infrastructure would have to have uh, appropriate adapters to accommodate a variety of standards. Thanks, Hasib. So kind of just want to summarize with a few tables. And again, this is really for your reference since we'll share this presentation with you after the meeting today. But we wanted to just kind of point out in this table, you know, it has the existing condition, the required or recommended condition, and then is action needed, yes or no. Um, and then kind of a little bit of notes off to the right. And so I just want to highlight the yeses that are in blue. So Justin mentioned the um, runways currently, the primary runway is currently designed to D3 conditions. And really for the forecasted demand right now is C2. And we're not going to go out and tear up the runway. Um, it's really just looking at the projects in the future um, to determine can we justify that additional width or not with the FAA for funding. And um, when we get to the point of a reconstruction is really when that justification is not there with the FAA. And so hopefully we'll be able to continue to maintain and rehabilitate most of the pavement so we don't get to that reconstruction phase for quite a while. But again, that's something that we'll have to look at um, as we move forward at the airport. And then of course, the same thing, um, so that's, that goes to the width um, primarily, but then the same thing on the crosswind runway also is that it's currently not AIP eligible. Um, but again, if it were to be AIP eligible, it's still too wide for really the needs of the current fleet that are using the airport. And so the existing pavement um, will need to be evaluated for eligibility for funding moving forward. And of course, as Justin mentioned, both runways will need to be renumbered. Um, so that's new paint, new signage um, at the airport. And then of course, Throughout, um, you know, just general wear and tear, pavement deteriorates just like the roads do. And so we look at the pavement condition index, that PCI number that you see on the screen. And so we have to look at that and um, see and kind of schedule out our rehabilitation and reconstruction of pavement. But we do have a concerning section on the southern end of the primary runway. Um, it's currently a PCI of a 69, and it really does require near term attention. And so we'll be meeting with um, WashDOT and FAA um, during the capital improvement planning process um, at the end of this year to really look and see where can we program that in even before the airport master plan is completed. So those are just a few things on the runway. So moving on to the taxiways, um, we talked a little bit about just parallel taxiways. Um, it's not a requirement that it meet, you know, is an exact parallel to the runway. It's just a lot more efficient that way. And so as that pavement deteriorates, we need to consider, does it make more sense to kind of realign um, some of the taxiways? And then of course, the um, angles on the taxiways don't, don't meet that 90 degree standard that the FAA has set. And so as projects move forward, and as we do the airport layout plan, you'll see all of those taxiways having that 90 degree turn. And then of course, same thing you'll see on taxiway um, Delta there, near term maintenance is required just because the PCI is continuing to decline as well as some of the others such as Foxtrot and Golf also. And then just the consideration of where in funding could we find money available and kind of prioritize um, lighting the east side of the airport. So support facilities. Um, so the apron, of course, same thing. It's a piece of pavement. We've got a plan and we want to make sure we're continuing to plan out that pavement maintenance, whether it's a seal coat or a, you know, an actual mill and overlay for the pavement. Um, a lot of general aviation pilots really prefer a standalone terminal pilot lounge facility. 
it's definitely not a requirement. You've got two great FBOs that are providing um, most of those services, but it's just something to consider as we look forward um, into the alternative section of where would that type of facility go if we were to have that facility built. And then of course, equipment and storage as a fleet of equipment grows, where does that equipment get stored? We don't wanna spend our, our hard grant, hard earned grant money on um, storing equipment outside in the weather. So where can we put a, a maintenance building? And then as he talked about is really those biofuels and the electric charging and how does that play into the alternatives and where could that future infrastructure go on the airport? So kind of taking that, I know that was a lot of information thrown at you. Um, hopefully most of it was not um, foreign and a lot of that was inventory information we discussed um, at our first technical advisory committee meeting. But we really wanna kind of hear from you and discuss alternatives. And if you see a, um, a need that we discussed in the facility requirement section of the presentation, where do you think that should go on the airport? So just wanna throw up a couple of aerials really quickly just to kind of refamiliarize you with the airport and kind of the layout. So as you can see, currently um, the east side is where most of the hangars are, where most of the businesses are as well. And then just a few discussion items that we've talked about. Um, so such as self-serve fuel, that's been a discussion item in the past, but then also biofuels and where, if we, if we decide we wanna move forward with biofuels in the future, where would we put that additional um, fuel storage now that the existing fuel storage area has been completely leased. So where, where could new tanks go? Does it make sense to locate those adjacent or is there somewhere else that would be more ideal on the airfield? And then of course, additional hangars um, as the HCP wraps up, hopefully we'll be able to develop those hangars. Where do you think those best fit? Um, and then of course, just pavement condition, we'll obviously continue to maintain those pavement items. And then um, some of the other things were lighting and instrument approaches. So I think we're gonna hop over to Darren, who's gonna pull up a aerial image and we're just gonna kind of talk and um, we'd love for you to raise your hand and let us know um, where some of these things you think should go. I mean, hangers are always, um, you know, obviously it's a big ticket item and how you can figure those impact a lot of other things. So that's always a, a good place to start. Darren, are you ready to share your screen? Uh, yeah, I just uh, let's see. should be should be working now. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So Darren has an aerial pulled up and we can just kind of mark it up as we go. Um, so I guess thinking about about hangers in particular, are there any comments from the TAC members on where you think hangers best fit into the airport? raising their hand here. Hearing none. Uh, I'm here. Are you there? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Um, this is Jeff Powell. I've built the uh, mic in November and I own the Oscar hanger. If you were going to add, you already have, I think, a preliminary design area down at the south end off of Taxi Lane Echo uh, for some additional right. hangers there. That would be a T hanger set where you could be, do small boxes. Yes. <clears throat> Rudy could probably comment to that. He, uh, I think, was around when that was built originally. Correct. That's a spot where you could put T hangers. You may put larger hangers, but I'm not sure that's at a, something you have a, a market for. Your T hangers, you do have a market for. Uh, on the other side of the field, since you have Whiskey Taxiway that is up to a standard and is lit, you do have some real estate over there that you could do the same. Of course, the biggest challenge is going to be when uh, mitigation is concluded with the pocket gopher because that's what's you'd have more hangers now if it had not been for that moratorium correct quite frankly uh, one other sidebar um the um, placement of the beacon is in the wrong spot it's no longer on the water tower 
It actually exists on top of the control tower. Thank you so, for correcting that. So for mapping purposes, you might want to make that correction. That's my two cents worth. Yes, I think you have a market for uh, small T hangers. I don't think you have a market for big, bigger hangers. That would be a custom order. Anybody that's doing that on a spec basis. So during not. the uh, survey, we received some feedback um, for box hangers. Um, but of course, that's do they have the funding to to lease the land and, and construct their own hangar or not? But there was there we were showing some demand. Um, but I do agree that the the T hangers seem to be the best best route to go for a developer. For today, that may change as the airport gets more active. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular location that you would see as more ideal along Whiskey? Well, <clears throat> any of the hangers that you're going to install needs to be fairly close to the utility. So the water, the sewer, um, your cable, because internet's going to be needed. Um, so I would say along Whiskey, you would be to the west, uh, around the uh, airport hang our airport uh, control tower itself is not a bad area mm -hmm. as long as you have utilities it's those services that are important right. of course and the the spot where uh, the uh, aviation office is you know you have some additional land there as well that could so that's all in the same general area okay the nice thing about doing that is that if you have a customer base that actually is coming from the I-5, it does make that commute shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one benefit. The other is it wouldn't be a bad idea to have more activity over on the west side since you have that infrastructure as far as the taxi lane goes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, and I think especially with the helicopter training, that's pretty significant on the east side too, just kind of separating some of that fixed wing traffic not congesting taxiway echo further is, is always nice. Yeah, taxiway echo is busy, but it's not too busy. I mean, the, the tower does a very good job of maintaining a, a good relationship between fixed wing and rotor. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any other kind of comments on hangers? No, okay. Um, so I guess fuel, if we were to um, evaluate kind of potential for biofuels at the airport, um, do you think it would be best to continue to expand kind of the existing fuel farm area? Yeah, or they, uh, is there another location? Leah, Rudy, I can't find my raise my hand thing, so I'll just talk okay. if you hear me. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, we, we did some preliminary evaluation before and there is room uh, to the east of the existing fuel farm to expand um, almost an equivalent size facility uh, to what's already there. So that area near east of the existing fuel farm is uh, available for expansion. That's kind of the area I was thinking of as well. Okay. Self-serve fuel, if... Um, perhaps an FBO, or maybe one day the port would like to put in self-serve. Um, we don't know we if any looked at self-serve fuel in the past and really the constraints or uh, challenges for uh, environmental uh, mm -hmm. review and compliance. And, and uh, you know, and, and we, we've worked with the city of Tumwater previously on some con concepts and it just, it, it just got um, really cost prohibitive to do that. And I don't mean that from the city of Tumwater's perspective, right. but they were a partner in design and review and looking at that. And, uh, you know, the environmental requirements just made it cost prohibitive. And it's also too, it, it finding a, 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 a centralized place um, that didn't right. infringe upon existing leaseholds that would uh, enable, you know, people to, to taxi up and fuel uh, mm -hmm. became a little bit of a challenge too. I know last time we kind of talked about um, 
you know, taxiway lights and, and taxiway echo. I guess what are the feelings from the tech members on the importance of echo? Obviously, you know, when we go to prioritize projects at the airport, you know, the runway pavement maintenance and correcting um, the panels that need to be replaced now obviously take priority. Um, meeting FAA design standards kind of takes priority over over lighting a new taxiway, but any comments on if taxiway echo should be included in alternate or lighting taxiway echo should be included in the alternatives analysis from the tax? I think it, uh, can you hear me? This is Jeff Powell again. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's uh, a challenge there because echo, at least 50% of echo taxi lane, you would have I think have to embed lighting in the asphalt itself because as you look at it going down towards uh, runway 17 or coming back into any of our hangar rows, uh, you have all asphalt there. So I don't know how you would, um, quite frankly, do a double lighting system. And Rudy, you can weigh in on this uh, if there's some other options because uh, one row you could do easily going down if you put it on the west side of the asphalt on taxi lane, taxi lane echo. Right. But otherwise you're gonna be, as you can see, in, uh, tearing up a lot of asphalt to put down an embedded uh, surface mounted lighting system. That gets, I think, pretty spendy, Rudy. Yeah, we haven't, um, haven't looked extensively into that. I don't know what the design standards that, that FAA allows for in-ground uh, taxiway lighting uh, certainly it is probably more expensive, but we've not looked in detail on that, but certainly something we can look at. Mm -hmm. But I think it's definitely a project that you would do when you're doing a maintenance, you know, you're doing a mill and overlay on, on Echo already. You wouldn't want to ever try to do it as a standalone. I, I can't speak about what Rudy thinks about that, but what I can say is I don't really know that it's necessary at this stage. Okay. I would rather I would rather we maintain our asphalt and maintain our uh, taxi link asphalt and pavement and runways uh, rather than look at spending money on something like that. If it came at a point where, like you say, we're doing a complete overlay down taxiway echo and you got power sources out there, yeah, that would be something to look at. But right now, I don't I don't think that you can justify the expense. Okay. And that was something really, I think, uh, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, but something we heard from the tower. Uh, the tower had mentioned that and then also uh, it was heavily on the user surveys that we did receive. And, and it, it, you know, may not be a, a now thing, but in the planning period, could it be in the, you know, end of the 20 year planning right. period? Well, if you're 20 years out, that may be viable, but uh, today I think you have if you will, pardon the term, bigger fish to fry. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's this whole plan looks at a, a near mid and long term type of planning. And, and some of these projects are maybe even be considered in that beyond the planning period, but keeping it on the books is uh, thoughts that have occurred uh, during the planning of it. Sure. Other ideas when it comes to alternatives from the TAC members? Obviously the alternatives will have to show, as we mentioned, kind of the corrected uh, angles at which the taxiways approach the runway pavement. So like for taxiway, Charlie meets um, at the 17 end is not a 90 degree angle. So that's gonna have to be, there's gonna be a lot of taxiway geometry that will have to be looked at in the alternative section to meet the design standards. So in, in discussions of all of the, you know, we've kind of covered some of the infrastructure ideas. Uh, what would the, TAC members, do you have any ideas on services that the airport would like to see? Such as, you know, we've had some people mention, you know, business ideas, you know, having, having a place for uh, 
aviation businesses to be out there, restaurants, maybe a, a standalone general aviation terminal for aircraft to be able to, if they're just picking up and dropping off airplanes without having to go through an FBO, that may be an option for them where they can just swing in. And those uh, standalone units generally have little meeting areas and, and can house airfield management as well in them. I'll weigh in on that. I think that uh, that is probably not something that you should do. It's a, it's a form of competition for the FBO operators. They all have facilities to have people meet in. And, uh, you know, you have restrooms, you've got parking already in place, and they're paying a fairly sizable mountain land lease. And to in, erect something that would somehow in some form or another potentially compete with them, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, secondly, um, I have not heard of anybody that has requested something like that. I know there's other airports that have that because they don't have any other facilities. They might have a self-serve gas facility, but there's no restroom attached to it or something like that. That's when it makes sense. But not when you have two operating FBOs um, that have all the services that any pilot would need at this point. Great, great input. So as we kind of look at the feasibility, the electric aircraft feasibility study from WashDOT and how we can kind of uh, move that forward at Olympia, um, you know, we need to think about where would those aircraft charging stations potentially be? How do we integrate that? Something else to also consider, of course, is just um, urban air mobility. Um, in other studies, we've kind of looked at preserving some space for um, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, and then, of course, just a helipad as well. Um, you know, if I know that was planned for in the last master plan, is that something we should continue to plan for? Those are some other kind of larger, larger ticket items that might take up uh, space on the airport that are infrastructure. Well, let's tick through some of those. First of all, uh, this is Jeff Powell again. I, PSC has a program that if you are, for example, developing an apartment community and you want to put in charging stations, mm -hmm. they will actually help in design. And I think they may even help in construction of that. So what I would do is engage either of the FBOs or both and say, what do you think about participating in this type of program? And then find, see if you can find some grant money. I'm sure there probably is some. Mm -hmm. um, how popular it's going to be at this stage is probably not very popular, but if you're looking five right. years down the road, I mm -hmm. think you have something to talk about. And this is why we do these uh, TAC meetings. So we can plan for the future. And I think that's the way to go. Uh, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not an FBO operator. All I have done is right. build some hangars there. I don't have a dog in that hunt. But I think that is your, if you want to make a viable airport, spending money to help your FBOs is well spent dollars because it may attract an uh, individual to their facility, which then gets you more operations and makes mm -hmm. a little bit of revenue for them. And it completes the loop as far as somebody being able to come and recharge their plane, shall we say here at Olympia, as opposed to Chehalis or some other airport that's not doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, the FBOs are a great asset to the airport and we need to take advantage of, of that as much as possible. This is Max from WashDOT. Uh, something that we've heard, you know, just kind of echo some of what Jeff said, uh, that, you know, a really good start is to include that ground vehicle charging um, you know, and the FBOs would be a logical spot to, to do that because it is, you know, you're starting to bring in extra power or extra, you know, capability to the airport, you know, and, and at least initially the FBO is probably going to be the spot that uh, are providing charging for, for these new aircraft. Yeah. To follow up on that, if you reach out, if somebody wants to reach out, maybe it should be an FBO operator, maybe it's this group, to PSE and have them come out and do an assessment, I think that would be wise. I actually have an electrical charging station at my hangar where my aircraft is, uh, but it's, you know, I paid to have a, a 220 set up and, and I have the charging unit, but it's specific to my car, but it, and it works fine. 
the, the beauty of that is that I get twice the mileage on electric than anybody else, I guess, because I have two different opportunities to charge my car during the course of a day. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a very good and positive item to talk about. We also have, of course, we have more and more electric vehicles. So um, as I said, we, are, we just got done doing an apartment community development and we put in four charging stations at that. And PSE was a little late to the game on that one. We did it independently. But after we got done telling them what we were doing, then they said, oh, well, we have a program. So whatever that's worth. Definitely. And that's really that next step in that piece of that kind of emerging technology piece of the master plan is to work with um, PSE um, to see what what grant funding could be available from them and what the infrastructure, the existing infrastructure, think like we have those trunk lines nearby. Um, that's great to know that you have a charger already and are, are actively using it at the airport. Every day. That's great. Any other comments? Now we've got Brad and Krista on the line as well. Anything from either of you? I don't really have much to add today um, as, as far as our operations go, everything. I mean, we're, we're pretty happy with where we, have, where we are and everything that's going on with the operations, operations at the airport. So, um, not a whole lot of input for me today. Okay, great. Thanks, Krista. I'll provide a little more input once I get some more details on the requirements for electrical vehicles that have come down through the state. I know we are now requiring, as, as was mentioned as a recent development, uh, that a certain percentage of those uh, parking stalls for regular cars and trucks and so forth are provided with EV access. So um, I think just Knowing that and then having that information, uh, I'll try to dig out the most current regs and get that to you. Um, and then I, there's a couple other items I'm thinking about in regard to that that I also want to do some further research and get back to you on. Okay, great. Thank you, Brad. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Um, I know we have a couple of representatives from the FAA. Any thoughts or comments? Sounds like maybe not. Doesn't look like Ben was able to join us today. Okay, uh, Rudy, anything further from you? Uh, no, nothing other than to say thank you for everybody who's participated today. We appreciate your, your time and, and input. Let me just hop back to our schedule here. I apologize, it changed. So just kind of looking forward to next steps from here, showing the schedule one more time. So right now we're kind of in July. As I mentioned, this is our second TAC meeting. Um, we'd like to meet again in September. And we've kind of moved that public open house also to September, as well as our presentations to the port and the city of Tumwater. Um, but we're really gonna kind of wrap up the investigation phase over the coming uh, few weeks and start in starting in August, dive into looking at solutions and our draft alternatives. So when we meet with you next time, what we would like to do is really start to have those draft alternatives pulled together. And so that way we can start to get feedback from you. Um, ideally, we like to have several different alternatives as we start to do an evaluation um, in determining that recommended or preferred alternative um, that moves into the airport layout plan and the capital improvement plan. So. Hope to see you again in September and um, definitely we would appreciate you helping us get the public open house word out once we have that date we'll be sure to share it with you as well and then um, the next time we would meet with you would be in February of 2022 after that September meeting. What so about any... that October meeting that you have there? Oh, so October that's a public open house right now okay. so that the TAC meeting would be here the one in red here. So oh, that would be in it. September and then in February. I understand. All right. Very good. Do we have a date on that uh, 
uh, we, open house? We, we do not um, yet. We just we just moved it this week. Um, so as soon as we kind of formulate that date, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, we'll be sure to start getting the word out about that. Good. Okay. Well, any questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Sure. Well, I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, great presentation. Seems like you guys have done a lot of work in the last two months uh, since that first meeting. So uh, nice job. And um, I thought all of your presentation was really helpful today, uh, especially for someone that normally works in the environmental side. I don't get into the planning. So, but I was able to follow because you did a nice job. So <laughs> thanks. And uh, just was taking some notes for Ben and kind of trying to stay ahead of some of the environmental issues, but I'll see you at the next next meeting. Great. Thank you for attending. We appreciate it. Thanks. I don't believe we have any members of the public on the phone. Um, I don't think so. If there are and anyone has a has a question, we'd be happy to take them. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. And we'll get a um, survey tool out to everyone via email looking at that September date so that way we can get that on your calendar as soon as possible. But thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.